Welcome to another episode of Eric Wheat Whiskey Studies, and we're continuing our study of the history of Scotch whiskey. In this video, we're going to be looking at uh, the expansion of Scotch whiskey around the world as it became a drink uh, for the world. And as I'm going over my notes, I'm going to be enjoying a dram of the Octomore 8.1 uh, from a Brook Aladi. This is a very intensely smoky peaty uh, a whiskey, not inexpensive, anywhere between $175 to $200, uh, but this is an absolutely uh, superb whiskey, which I actually uh, reviewed live with uh, Keith from um, a Malted a Man Cave, and we just really, really enjoyed this. All right, let's get into our study. Unofficial blending of batches of malt whiskey was routinely carried out by merchants and publicans in order to achieve greater conformity for their customers following the practices that were common in place in much of the wine and spirit trade. So in Champagne, the idea is to have uh, a house style, one in which customers, if they like that house style, they know they can go back year after year and get a wine similar to what they had before. Well, it was the same way with uh, blended scotches. If people liked a particular scotch, they wanted to know if they could go back and get another one just like that. Now, whiskey reviewers, whiskey aficionados, we like differences. We like to have a discussion as to whether the uh, Octomore 8.1 or 8.2 or one of the earlier versions, one of the later versions was better. It, it makes it more interesting for us to sort of compare um, batch to batch, bottle to bottle, vintage to vintage, age to age. And so that's why we like single malt scotches. However, blended scotches uh, have the goal to uh, create a consistent uh, whiskey uh, from bottle to bottle. The Forbes McKinsey Act of 1853 made it legal to vat or mix malt whiskeys from the same distillery while under bond, which meant the process could be carried out before excise duty was paid. A year later, duty was equalized between Scotland and England and the Scottish Board of Excise, which had existed since 1707, was abolished. One of the first people to exploit this new legislation was Edinburgh wine and spirits merchant Andrew Usher, who also acted as agent for Glenlivet Distillery, being responsible for introducing it to the London market in 1844. Working with his son, also named Andrew, Usher launched Usher's Old Vatted Glen Livet, or OVG, a vatting of Glen Livet malts from different years within months of the act coming into force. Usher Sr. died in 1855. So not only are there blended malt whiskeys in which you take malt whiskeys from different distilleries to make a non-age statement whiskey, you also have blending within a distillery, it's still called a single malt, um, in which you have a baseline year let's say 10 years, 12 years, and you may have older whiskeys that are going into that, uh, but you want to have a house style for your 10-year-old, for your 12-year-old, and you're going to put more or less of from uh, casks um, to get that profile and, and use the 12 year as your minimum age. So you could put 50% of a 12-year-old, or of a or of a ten year old, and then but to maintain a profile, you might use some eighteen, you might use some twenty, but the minimum age is going to be twelve year old. But the, again, the idea is or the goal is uh, to give you a consistent twelve year old or ten year old uh, from batch to batch. Now uh, the Octomore eight point one uh, isn't um, focusing on a vintage uh, date. Um, but rather it's focusing on a particular style. And so it comes in a series of, of different numbers. Uh, this is bottled at 59.3% alcohol by a volume. And let's give it a little sip. Mm, mm. It doesn't have the seaweed and medicinal notes of the South Island distilleries, say Ardbeg, Lafroy, maybe even Lagavon but it does have a briny, salty note. It's like a salted chocolate. It's super sweet, really, 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 really sweet. 
I'll say some, some cherry notes, it's a little bit of a citrus to it, but mostly what I'm getting is very intense chocolate, smoke, and saltiness. And it is really, really delicious. If you've ever had a salted dark chocolate, that's exactly what this is. By combining Glenlivet whiskey distilled in a variety of years, OVG offered much greater consistency than had been previously possible. But the search for ultimate consistency reached uh, its ultimate in 1860 when William Gladstone's Spirit Act went a stage further by allowing malts and grains under bond to be blended for the first time. Together, these two pieces of legislation laid the practical and legal foundations of the great blending boom that followed. So blended whiskeys had been going on by local merchants who were blending um, malt from distilleries, but now they're able to do it straight from the distillery. In the wake of the Spirits Act, the ushers were again quick to exploit the potential of the new legislation, and Andrew Usher Jr. converted OVG from a vatted malt to a true blended whiskey. Having had the foresight to purchase Glen Sands Lowland Malt Distillery, renaming it the Edinburgh Distillery in 1859. This provided a source of a light style malt spirit ideal for blending. Andrew Usher Jr.'s son, Sir Robert, noted that comparatively little whiskey was sold in England prior to 1860. However, after that date, the trade in Scotch whiskey increased by leaps and bounds, the reason being, to my mind, that the blend is lighter and more easily digested and thus more suitable to the public taste. My personal opinion is that the pot still is improved and made more wholesome when blended with patent. So what Andrew Usher Jr.'s son is saying is, um, by blending now grain whiskey with malt whiskey, it became uh, much more suitable uh, for the average palate. Blended Scotch whiskey offered an easier drinking and more consistent alternative to pot still malt, malt whiskey, and in all probability would have been a great success with consumers throughout Britain and far beyond, regardless of external events. However, its success was aided to a significant degree by the havoc reached on the French brandy industry by two pestilence the odium powdery mildew infection of the 1850s, and the insect phylloxera, which destroys vines by attacking their leaves and roots. It was first identified in France in 1863, and during the 1880s, these two blights caused the production of cognac to cease almost totally, with brandy drinkers in England soon required a substitute. German winemakers and potato growers manufactured a disgusting, cheap alternative dubbed Hamburg brandy. So what happened was uh, there is this louse called phylloxera. It was native to the United States. Uh, the genus of grapevines in the United States is different than those in Europe. In, in Europe, it's vitis vinifera. And really, winemaking is not really suitable for a Native American uh, uh, vines. It just produces a real foxy, funky wine. So what happened was, is they're importing uh, European varietals into the United States, planting them here, and they didn't do really well. They were getting destroyed by this phylloxera. Well, somebody got the bright idea to export back to Europe, and the phylloxera uh, louse went back to Europe, specifically, uh, for as far as we know, uh, in the Rhone and, and down in southern France, and there it just wreaked havoc. The, the native vines of the United States or North America have had an immunity to this louse because they'd been living with it for thousands of years. But um, the Vitis vinifera variety in Europe was not accustomed to it, and so it just wreaked havoc. Starting in the mid 19th century, it just went through all of Europe destroying vines. Now, to make a long story short, eventually somebody figured out in Denison, Texas, uh, that what was needed to uh, do to deal with phylloxera is have American rootstock of vines and then graft on Vitis vinifera, the European uh, genus for vines, and that would provide some resistance to phylloxera. But it took them a long time to figure that out. And in the meantime, 
uh, vines were destroyed in Europe. Got no vines, got no grapes, got no grapes, got no wine, got no wine, got no brandy. And so what happened was is people had to go somewhere else to get their spirit. And where they went was Scotland. That's right. Uh, brandy and wine's demise led to uh, the boom in the Scotch whiskey industry. At this point, a new breed of entrepreneurs took to the Scotch whiskey stage, and with imagination, innovation, and brilliant salesmanship, they began to establish Scotch whiskey as a drink for the world. The group of distillers whose fortunes were made during the blended whiskey boom included James Buchanan and Company Limited, producers of the black and white brand, John DeWar and Sons Limited, John Walker and Sons Limited, and Mackey and Company Limited of Whitehorse fame, while the already well-established Whiskey House of Haig grew in stature and in wealth. From 1875, they could register the trademarks that could not be pirated, and innovation in printing and publishing allowed them to advertise their wares worldwide. Whiskey had already established a market among the ever-growing expatriate population in North America, Australasia, the Far East, and Southern Africa. Advertisements appeared regularly in the press in those countries for both blends and single malts. Now, one of the most interesting characters during this time period uh, was uh, Tommy DeWar uh, of uh, DeWar and Sons. Brothers John and Tommy DeWar inherited their father's Perth-based wine and spirits business established in 1846. While John tended to stay in Perthshire and focus on the administration of the family company, Tommy was renowned as one of the most flamboyant figures in the Scotch whiskey industry. One of the great entrepreneurs of the late Victorian blended Scotch whiskey boom, Whiskey Tom, sailed yachts and bred racehorses, but was also a hardworking and charismatic ambassador for the family whiskey business, once visiting no fewer than 26 countries in two years to increase its network of agencies. Dewar was also known for his many Dewarisms, including a teetotaler is one who suffers from thirst instead of enjoying it. He pioneered novel promotional techniques, including film and the use of now ubiquitous illuminated neon signs. As blended Scotch whiskey sales grew in 1877, the Distillers Company Limited, or DCL, was formed by a combination of six Scotch whiskey distilling companies, namely McFarlane and Company, John Baldwin Company, John Hagen Company, McNabb Brothers and Company, Robert Mowbray and Company, and Stewart and Company. Uh, just a note: a DCL would later become part of what we know today as uh, Diageo. DCL had its ordinance and a trade association called the Scotch Distillers Association, formed in 1865. This, in turn, was a successor to the 1856 trade agreement between six lowland grain distilleries, established at a time of poor trading conditions in order to avoid overcapacity and consequent price cutting between rivals. Now, my throat's getting a little parched, so let's take a wee sip. Mm, 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 mm. When DCL took control of Edinburgh's Caledonian Grain Distillery in 1884, a number of leading blenders outside of the DCL umbrella became concerned about the organization's near monopoly of grain whiskey production. The result was the establishment of the North British Distillery Company in Edinburgh, which set about constructing its own grain distillery, which went into production in September 1887. Of the three founders, what became known as NB was Andrew Usher, who was appointed its first chairman, while William Sanderson of VAT69 fame took on the role of managing director, and John Grabby of Krabby's Green Ginger Wine served as vice chairman. Among their original shareholders were Peter Mackey of White Horse Distillers, John Walker and Sons, McKinley and Company, McDonald and Muir, John DeWar and Sons, A and A Crawford, Buchanan and Company, and Author Bell and Sons. You want to know what makes whiskey the most epic drink of all time? How about f***ing everything? Whiskey is the most important meal of the day. 
That's what my kids taught me. Oh, you're a gluten-free vegan? Well, I've got this great new diet plan. It's called Shut Up and Drink Your Whiskey. The truth is that the only thing you really need to know about whiskey is that you should be drinking it right now. Cheers. So one of the interesting things to note in our study of the history of Scotch whiskey is there are certain elements which are outside of the control of the whiskey industry. Uh, it could be a foreign war. It could be the economic depression of another company which they're dependent on as consumers. It could be a natural disaster um, or uh, which could positively or negatively affect the industry, uh, such as the phylloxera plague, which affect, negatively affected wine, which then affected brandy, but positively opened up the market for scotch whiskey. Other things we have to also look at is there are also some new inventions and in innovation in terms of uh, printing and the ability to advertise and um, as the countries became more global, the ability to sort of get out and get their uh, brand known. Of course, today, uh, the internet, of course, is so important in making brands known. Whiskey tubers and creating videos are, are part of that and making brands and, and bottles uh, known, um, which is kind of funny because we're not part of the business. We're not paid for it. Um, Perhaps some get free bottles or some get uh, special treatment, uh, but it's not been so uh, in, in my case necessarily. Um, but there are things which you sort of have to be aware of uh, where the next wave is going and what is going to affect your business. And you have to sort of be on your guard as well as to uh, a negative thing. So, for example, we have a major boom going on. And people in the industry, whether you're uh, uh, in retail, wholesale, dis distribution, or production, uh, you need to be paying attention to uh, world events and try to anticipate how this could affect um, consumer habits, which then could affect uh, um, your, your sales or might even affect your production. For example, changing laws uh, change in relationship with foreign companies, the ability countries, and in order to uh, export to certain country countries. Right now, India uh, import it has a hundred and fifty percent tax. Uh, if there was a trade negotiation between Scotland or the UK and India to that lowered, um, Scotch whiskey would then have a huge boom in India. India is a big consumer uh, country, but most of their consumption is of local Indian whiskey, much of which actually has rum in it. But should um, trade negotiations change between Scotland or the UK and India, we would see a flood of uh, Scotch whiskey going into India. Now, you might say, well, I don't live in India, so I don't really care about that. Well, there would be a domino effect in the market around the world uh, namely, uh, what we are looking for and what we want might not be as available here because it's sort of making its way over to India. The similar thing has happened in the wine industry, particularly, say, with Bordeaux, uh, when the Chinese became big fans of Bordeaux wine. Suddenly, the United States, who had been a faithful uh, consumer and purchaser of Bordeaux wines, uh, found itself in a greater competition for bottles, not only in terms of allocation, but price, price is really jacked up. There is uh, a really good documentary on this, uh, on, on China and its consumption of French wine called uh, The Red Obsession. If you're interested in this, even if you're not into wine, it still gives you sort of an idea in how the purchasing habits of other countries, even unexpected countries, you might not expect China to suddenly become uh, a major purchaser of a wine and consequently how that would have a ripple effect in the wine industry. In the same way, if India should change its laws, we would see a ripple effect around the world in the availability and the, the uh, cost of Scotch whiskey. It's just one factor that you got to sort of pay attention to is think about how markets change, um, how uh, whether it's tariffs, trade negotiations between countries change, and how that can then turn around and have an effect on Scotch whiskey. All right, uh, that's it for this uh, lesson. Uh, uh, if you subscribe to this channel, I want to thank you very much. If you haven't yet subscribed, I would greatly appreciate it if you would subscribe. Give it a thumbs up. Share with your friends on Facebook. 
Twitter, and other social networking channels. And until next time, cheers.